All right, well, uh, grab your Bibles. Uh, if you got one there in the chair next to you, it's on page 976. We're going to read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 uh, together. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 on page 976. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus." For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Well, this morning, I have a great privilege to introduce you to a couple of my friends. Um, uh, we've been trying to, to get out in front of you these last several months uh, ministries that we support as a church. So whether it was Compassion International a few months ago or, you know, even the things we've done in our community, trying to help you understand that when you give to missions, it's more uh, it, that, that, that there are, are definite things that are happening uh, with your giving. And, uh, and I get to introduce you to a couple of my friends here today um, that most of you don't know that when we give, uh, this is a ministry we give to. Um, I guess it was back in around 1996, Michelle and I were attending a little church in Kansas City, Missouri, and our paths, by the grace of God, crossed with Daryl and Terry McCarthy. Um, and little did we know the kind of influence they would have in our lives at the time. I was practicing law, happily so, I guess you could say, and then the Lord invaded my life, and, um, and some of you know the story, called me into ministry. But I got to be honest, I was, I was b- b- both Michelle and I, we were perplexed, we didn't know what does that mean? You're called to ministry. Are we even hearing from God right now? And so we began to talk to people about, you know, is this the Lord in our lives? And, and one of those uh, were uh, Daryl and uh, Terry McCarthy, who are here today. And uh, being mature Christians and having been in ministry for years, uh, they helped us navigate a pretty big, uh, life-changing, altering moment in our lives. And, uh, and, 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 and we're so helpful in doing that. But... but um, that's not why they're here today. Uh, they've actually been flown out here by uh, Biola University. Don't hiss APU students. Um, <laughs> Biola is actually having Terry is going to be speaking all day tomorrow at uh, Biola. And truthfully, I wish I could let you hear from both of them. They are both incredible speakers, love the Word of God, love the people of God, and love to see Jesus proclaimed among the nations and, uh, and gifted, godly uh, people that God has used in, in my life and Michelle's life. Um, we're going to take up an offering uh, like we normally do, but I just want you to know ahead of time that when you give today, any undesignated offerings are going to go to to the organization that they're a part of or that they've started. 24 years ago, Daryl started an organization called International Institute for Christian Studies. And uh, I, I consider it a great honor for us as a church to partner with this ministry. This is perhaps one of the most strategic things we do as a church, and you're going to hear why. Let me just frame it for you. Daryl um, uh, saw a need many years ago where uh, he realized the future leaders of every country are in universities. And so Daryl began to send graduate level, people that have graduated from, you know, graduate degrees and above into foreign universities, many of them closed countries, I mean, to China, uh, the, to the, the Soviet Union, now former, you know, Soviet Union and, and, and the Soviet bloc countries, and, and began, and he'll tell you more about this, began to put 
Christian professors in those environments, not to go and just teach Christianity, to go and teach politics and government and law and economics and communications and English and all these things from a Christian worldview. And so um, we support the ministry. We support them in Lithuania. We support another couple uh, in, uh, they're in the Ukraine, in Prague, in, in, yeah, in Prague and um, and so this is part of our investment in, in what we do. But, but uh, I am so excited to have them here. When I heard they were coming out and we had an opportunity to sort of, you know, jump on what Biola was already doing and saying, yes, yes, please come to our church. We can't wait to have you. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I've been praying for this day because I, I believe in kind of the setting that we're in, some of you are going to hear Daryl talk and he's going to preach the Bible. He's not here to just tell you stories. And that's what I love about them. They love the Bible like I love the Bible and like we love the Bible. And, uh, but, he, but in the context of that, you're going to hear uh, more about this ministry. And my great prayer is, uh, is that this will tug on some of your hearts in a way where you say, maybe this is, maybe this is something God's calling me to do and, and begin that conversation. So they're going to be around. They'll be out in the family room. There's literature out there for you to pick up to know more about it. Uh, and I'd invite you, love you to go out there and do that afterwards. So, so Foothill Church, please help me welcome uh, Daryl McCarthy to come and open the word of God for us. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Well, you can see now why when uh, Chris and I are out and about, they just think it's father and son. You know, the physical resemblance is so striking, don't you think? <laughs> it is great to be here at Foothill Church, and we are so grateful for your support of the International Institute for Christian Studies. In fact, uh, my own life was greatly impacted by a, a young 44-year-old man. He... Uh, he was a rich kid. His father had been uh, successful in the construction business. His mother flitted back and forth between New York and Paris on shopping trips. But he really didn't have any direction in college. He had no faith, no real goal, just floundering in life. But he had one professor that transformed his life. And in 1974, the same year I graduated from college, he pulled a professor in his, as an engineering and business management major that absolutely galvanized his life. He was floundering, and this professor got his attention. This professor was devoted to the faith. He was devoted to changing his students' lives so in turn they would change the world. He had a purpose for his teaching. Now, this young student, Rich kid. They, they described him as shy, tall, handsome, just a, a nice kid, but no purpose. All of a sudden, he became very devoted to the faith. He began reading everything he could, fasting, praying, crying out, I want to make a difference in the world. Now, the university was the King Abdul Aziz University in Saudi Arabia. The professor was Palestinian-born Islamic scholar Abdallah Azam. And the student was Osama bin Laden. One professor changed one student and I think we could say changed the world. Charles Malik, who was a great Lebanese diplomat. Actually, he was the president of the United Nations General, Sec General Assembly and Security Council. He wrote much of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Strong follower of Jesus. He said one day, the university is a clear-cut fulcrum with which to move the world. Change the university, and you change the world. And that's why, as Chris mentioned, the International Institute for Christian Studies is devoted to placing Christian professors across the entire range of disciplines teaching on the faculties of public universities outside of North America. We have 63,000 Christian professors here in America. We're blessed with more than any other nation in the world. But in many nations... There are few, if any. We live in Lithuania. Now, no, that's not where they make the lithium batteries. That's, that's a different kind of place. 
but Lithuania is in the Baltics, former Soviet Republic. Terry teaches at the Lithuania University of Educational Sciences. Now, you can easily hear that acronym in your mind. How would you like to go to a LUS university? I mean, that doesn't do well, very well for a basketball chant, and basketball is the national religion of Lithuania. But as far as we can identify, we've only found two other believers, Lithuanian believers, in that university of around 10,000 students. She is, as far as we can determine, the first Christian professor her students have ever had. In fact, the other couple that your church supports is, is uh, teaching in Czech Republic. Prague is the most atheistic city in the world. 60% of the people say they're atheists or agnostics. And so every time one of our IICS, it always sounds like you're stuttering, but IICS professors walks in a classroom, that's the first Christian, certainly the first educated Christian those students have ever met. So immediately their paradigm has to shift slightly at least that this is not a total blubbering idiot, and yet they're a follower of Jesus. It, it does havoc to their worldview. But we are grateful for the privilege of serving in Lithuania and to proclaim the name of Christ in that country. It is a depressed country. They found their freedom from the Soviet Union 22 years ago, but freedom did not bring the happiness and fulfillment they thought it would bring. It brought a lot of good things, but not fulfill fulfillment. And they're now depressed, so they have the highest suicide rate in the world. So much of our task there is simply to bring the joy and the freshness of Jesus to that country. And we would ask that you would pray with us and I'll explain a little bit more about what we're trying to do during the course of this time. You heard the word of the Lord, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Let's focus on that last verse for sake of time this morning. The last verse, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now this verse answers three simple questions. Who am I? Why am I here? And what am I supposed to do? Basic questions, huh? First of all, who am I? Well, this verse answers that. For we are God's workmanship. The Greek word there is poema. We are God's poem. We're his work of art, his masterpiece, his handiwork. Now, you got to be frank with me. Even those of you that have this bright smile on your face, I'm sure there are days when you wake up and you really don't feel like God's masterpiece, you know? I mean, don't you, don't you have days like this that you just... I mean, I can assure you, when I got up this morning about 5 o'clock and went in bleary-eyed and looked at myself in the mirror, I, I did not say, McCarthy, you are a masterpiece. I mean, you know, I'm not going to say that any time of the day. Some of you have got a better chance of saying that. But in Isaiah 43, God reminds us, I created you. I love you. In fact, he says, I have written your name on the palms of my hands hands. God has your name written on the palm of his hand. You are God's masterpiece. And that truth should transform your self-image. It should inform your sh the shape of your career plans. It should inform what you're studying in the university. It should inform how you approach your job. It should, approach, it should shape all of your relationships. You are God's masterpiece. Second, a few weeks ago I was speaking on this same verse to a group of business leaders in Kansas City. It was one of those early morning meetings for Christian businessmen about meet at 645, and some of those guys... They didn't even know there was a 6.45 a.m. You know, they, 
you could tell they kind of came wandering in from the dark. And I'm just starting my talk, and I just said those words, you're God's masterpiece, and that should shape our perception of who we are. And my front tooth, it, it was a crown, and it came out right, at, right then. I, I just told them, I said, you know, I had a birthday a couple of weeks ago, turned 61, and life is good, and God is good, it's wonderful, and we're God's masterpiece. And I just said that, and my tooth came out, and at first I thought I could fake it. So my son was there in the group, and he said, I saw you slip something in your pocket. He just, I thought you just had, you know, something caught in your mouth or something, and just, and I thought I could go on, and I tried to say the next word, and I don't know if you've ever tried to talk without your front teeth. <laughs> I mean, it changes everything. It was like, so the second thing we want to say <laughs> is, why are, why are we here? I, I mean, I, real, I realized in one sentence, there's no future in this. <laughs> now, now, God is very good. God is so good. That morning, for some reason, I'd stuck, now you young people have no idea what this is about, there, but there's this stuff you can get at Walgreens, and it's called Fix-A-Dent. <laughs> and it's for sticking parts together that are falling off, <laughs> especially teeth. And so, fortunately, I had it too, right in my pocket. I mean, you know, you got to be prepared. You know, the Boy Scouts rule. And so I said, gentlemen, we have a problem. I just lost my tooth. And, of course, they howled with laughter. I knew, I knew most of these guys really well. I've known them for years. And I said, uh, give me just a minute. And I said, uh, here, I think I've got the tools to fix this. So I just dabbed a little glue on there. Ta -ta, and fortunately went on with the rest of the talk. So it is a reminder, you are God's masterpiece, but we are in a fallen world, and we do break. So uh, the second, reason, second question we have answered is, why am I here? Why am I here? Paul says, we're God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So I am God's work. I will do God's work. Can you remember those words? I am God's work. I'm his masterpiece. I will do God's work. We are created in Christ Jesus to do God's work. God created you. You for a specific purpose. You remember... Eric Little in the movie Chariots of Fire. He was a runner, Olympic medalist. And his sister Mary, from, they're from Scotland, and she's protesting about him running all these races. And he says, oh, Mary, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his good pleasure. When do you feel God's good pleasure? What did God make you to do? When do you feel his pleasure? And I can see some of you, especially those of you who grew up in church. You're ready for the punchline. Here's the punchline you think is coming. So, since you're created by God and you're to do God's work, therefore all of you should go quit your jobs and go start preaching or be a missionary or knowing me, be a professor at some university overseas. That's what you're wanting us to do because there's sacred work and there's secular work. That's where you're going, isn't it, McCarthy? No, but I appreciate you bringing that subject up. <laughs> it gives me a chance to tell you what I believe Scripture really says about this. First of all, Christ is the Lord over every job, every vocation, every job that you have here today. I don't care how good, well-paying it is or how bad the pay is. I don't care what it involves. Well, as long as it's a legit, I'm not talking about a Christian prostitute or Christian drug dealer or Christian hitman. You know, there are limits. There are limits. But legitimate occupations, that is a holy vocation because Christ is the Lord over every vocation. In the New Testament, there aren't two classes of citizens. When I was growing up, there was kind of this view. Now, there's 
the preachers and the missionaries. They're the really spiritual people. And then you got the rest of us people down here, and we're doing the secular work. And our job is to pay and to pray, and we'll be okay. That was just kind of how the system worked. Two classes of citizens. But in the New Testament, you don't have two classes of citizens. In, in the Bible, we're all called to the ministry. You are in the ministry. I don't care what your job is, whatever your subject that you're studying in the university, you are called to the ministry. And that subject is a holy subject. Now, that should change our view of our jobs. Now, now to be sure, I have lots of friends when they ask, what does God want from me? There is a change. Our pastor is an example. I mean, you, you, you heard that. We were kind of a part of that. Actually, you were attending a dinner of IICS. I think it's when one of the change points came, you realize you were serving God in, in, as a lawyer, doing a wonderful job. But in his case, God had a different direction for him. My guess is for most of you, God's purpose is for you to continue where you are, doing what you're doing. I'm going to dabble with the where part here in a little bit. But your job is your ministry. You are called and you're to serve where you are. You don't come up to me after the, church, after the service and say, well, I'm an engineer, but I want to get into the ministry. I don't want to hear you ever say that to me. Because you know what I'm going to say. I'll say, you are in the ministry. You need to embrace that role. Think about Jesus' example himself. God becomes a human being. Becomes a human being with a real body, with thumbs and fingers and elbows and nose and ears and a real human being of certain height certain weight and he has let's say 33 years so take about 12 years as a child and then in the Jewish system you're apprenticed into a trade at 12 years of age so Jesus spent the next 18 years in labor, in manual labor, as a carpenter, as a craftsman. He was a small business owner. He worked hard, long days. He knew what it was to meet a payroll. He knew what it was to try to pay the bills and support his mother and his brothers and sisters. God, in his infinite wisdom, became a human being and spent 18 years in a job job and then three years teaching a friend of mine P Paul Marshall says Jesus spent more time sawing boards than he did preaching sermons now does that say something to you about the value that God places on labor on your job, that what Jesus was doing during those years as a carpenter was no less holy than when he was standing on the mountain preaching his sermon. In God's world, there is no secular job. All of you, if you're serving Jesus and you're serving with excellence and with a heart to worship him, you are in sacred duty. If you're a believer, there is no secular job. You are in the ministry. You are serving God. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 puts it like this. Whatever you do, and he doesn't say, eh, if you're a pastor or if you're a missionary or a professor with ICS. No, he says, whatever ever you do whether it's plumbing or sales or IT or driving the pizza car or caring for the elderly or farming whatever it is 
work at it. Here's the first part. With all your heart as working for the Lord. So your, your employer is not Apple or Pizza Inn or Azusa Pacific University. That's not your employer. You are working for the Lord, every one of us. He is our employer, not for human masters since you know that you will receive an re inheritance from the Lord as your reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. C.S. Lewis put it like this. The work of a Beethoven and the work of a cleaning woman becomes spiritual on precisely the same condition, that of being offered to God, of being done humbly as to the Lord. So the central question you have to ask is, what are the good works which God prepared in advance for you to do? Now, here's my problem, and here's, here's the kicker for some of you. In my experience, many Christians are where they are and doing what they're doing by default because they haven't stopped and asked, what else, where else? Your pastor is a man who stopped and said, where else, what else, and God had a different direction. That means he was listening to God. You see, once we confess Christ as Lord, everything in our lives come to, comes under his jurisdiction. Our jobs, everything. Let me illustrate. In my work with the International Institute for Christian Studies, we're privileged to serve with a we have 54 other colleagues teaching at universities in 26 other countries. Now, these folks teach psychology and plant genetics and business and music, the arts, uh, the, whole, the whole range of fields. And they long ago knew and realized their field is holy to God. No less so than theology. Because all these fields are a part of human flourishing. It's a part of how God created us with bodies and minds, setting us in relationships in a culture with governments and businesses. So all the fields are holy. So there's, the easy question was, where should we teach? And most of them had comfortable lives. Many had tenured positions. And they left that to raise their support because most universities overseas don't. I mean, Terry's pay is less than our rent on a monthly basis. So we're, that's why we're grateful that your church helps support us to make it possible for us to be there. So they go out to raise the support, leave their families. Why would they do that? Because of the need. Because they realized their field is holy, but where is a critical issue? For instance, one of, one of our Former colleagues had a tenured position in business at James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. This is 10 years ago. He had a six-digit income, way over six digits. He was living the good life, but he was always listening to God. He was serving God in Virginia, but listening to God, God said, Hanoi, Vietnam is your place. So he left his beautiful home in the Shenandoah Mountains and moved with his wife and his 14-year-old daughter and 12-year-old son to Hanoi, Vietnam. Now, he was teaching business. And, of course, he's a follower of Jesus. Business is a holy field because he's helping people emerge out of poverty. That is a good thing. That's an intrinsically good thing. And he's doing it with a heart of worship to God. And he's also telling people about Jesus wherever he goes. In spite of constant surveillance by the, Chinese gover by the, by the communist government. One day he presented a Bible to the dean of the business faculty. And I, I told Chris last night, I love being in Vietnam because it's the only place in the world where at five foot seven, I am the tallest guy in the room. <laughs> Now I know how you tall guys feel. But the business dean took the Bible, clasped it to his chest, and said, all of my life I've wanted to know who God is, but I didn't know how to find him. Now I know how to find him. Do you think in that moment Roger Ford had any regrets about walking away from a tenured position 
with the six-digit income and the beautiful home in the Shenandoah Mountains? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I am God's work. I will do God's work. Third question then, who am I? God's masterpiece. Why am I here? Created to do, to do good works. How do I find God's purpose for me is the third question, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let me tell you a little bit how I've tried to figure this one out. It's not always easy, but let me share a little bit of my story with you. I think number one is important, surrender. Surrender your life to Jesus. Now, that means a little bit more than just getting saved, as we used to call it. Surrender is not a one-time event. I mean, I came to Jesus when I was eight years old, okay? That is several lifetimes ago for some of you people, you know? That was 53 years ago. So that means during those years, there have been re-surrenderings. And in fact, about 59, I had a particular re-surrendering. I'd started this organization, International Institute for Christian Studies, when I was 37, was running it, was comfortable with it. I was very comfortable sending other people to go overseas, spending a lot of time myself, but never living overseas. I was, I was in my groove, doing my thing, having a good time. But there was this growing restlessness that there was a next chapter. Now, part of that growing restlessness was my wife knocking me in the ribs day after day. I want to teach overseas. Because she had taught in China for several years. Actually, she trained Chris and Michelle when they went to China the first time years and years ago with this little organization, ESIC or whatever it is. What is it? ULS, ULS whatever it is. <laughs> and she wanted to be back overseas. She had done a Fulbright in Moscow and loved it. I want to, want to be overseas. And I said, well, i got a, I got a day job. I, you know, I really can't just walk off. I had to surrender my understanding of what my job meant. And mine is pretty well what you would probably call in any def definition a ministry job. But it's important even when you're in a professional Christian job to keep surrendered. So eventually she had this opportunity to teach in Lithuania. University saying, please come teach. And knowing that she'd be teaching students for whom she would be the first Christian professor they would ever see. I wrestled with it. Now, let's face it. You don't get more flexible the older you get. I mean, <laughs> just look at me. Do I look like a wild thing? No. <laughs> I'm kind of a button-down sort of, I want everything kind of in its cubby hole. You know, just kind of, let's, let's get everything stowed away here. I want things well-ordered. I... Maybe not a 10-year plan, but five-year better be pretty, you know, sub-points, all this stuff. Got to have a clear outline. I don't like surprises. No surprises. And so for me to say, I'm going to release all this, I wrote to the board and I said, uh, uh, hey, a little surprise here. Uh, Terry's taking a job in Lithuania, so we're going to be moving to Lithuania. I know I'm the president of the organization and all this stuff, but uh, we'll, we'll take care of it. I wasn't careless about it, though. I said, we've been trying to hire somebody to run this thing on a daily basis so I could be free to do something different. We don't have anybody. But I told the board, I said, I had this sense that it's kind of like Moses at the edge of the Red Sea, that if he just stick his toe in the water, the water did not part before he stuck his big toe in there. It didn't happen. Now, God was going to do it. But Moses' part was sticking his little pinky right in that water, and then at that moment, whew, it happened. Now, the scary part are those seconds as you're sticking your toe in the water, thinking, is anything going to happen? And so it was really scary for me. I'm a duty-driven person. I'm going to do my duty if it kills me, and I might kill some other people in the process, too. <laughs> So I wasn't going to carelessly walk away from a ministry and let it flounder. But you know, within weeks after we made the commitment to move to Lithuania, God in His wonderful providence and grace 
supplied an executive vice president to run the ministry, the daily operations, and he's doing a far better job than I ever did or could have done. But I had to stick my toe in the water. Some of you are wrestling with this nudging from God that there's something different, something next. Surrender is scary, especially for a buttoned-down sort of guy like me. I don't want unknowns, but surrender, there's a lot of unknowns. There's no way I could have predicted everything that would happen. Uh, and it's not always easy. We got grandkids, and I am a, I'm a grandpa sort of guy. We got Jack, who's six years old, and Kempis, named after Thomas Kempis, four years old, Athena's named after the goddess of war, <laughs> two years old. I love those grandkids. They stay with us most weekends when we're home. Leave them at this time in their lives? I mean, look, I didn't do a great job raising my kids, so this is my second chance <laughs> on my grandkids. What am I going to do? Both our dads have passed away, so our moms are widows. We just, we, we just leave them? Surrender can be difficult. It is costly. Our kids, our kids were upset at us. Hey, your job is to send other people. You're, you're not supposed to go. Your job is to send people. We, you can't abandon us now. We need you. They were upset. Surrender is not pleasant. It's not nice and easy like we make it sound like in church. It's not at all. It's messy. It's messy. It's hard. It can be painful. Second, pray. I was praying desperately, asking God, Lord, please make this clear. I know I'm dull-minded and hard-headed. You're going to have to make this really, really clear. Some of you, and especially let's uh, just say man-to-man -man here, some of us guys have a hard time hearing God's voice. I do, and most men I meet do. If some of you men are wrestling with God's direction, I would recommend you, you take a time out. Try to take a weekend, two or three days, and get away alone with God. Just your Bible, a piece of paper, and a pen. Go to a monastery or empty church or someplace alone where you can say, God, at any cost, I will do what you want me to do. I just need to know what it is. Pray. Ask him, God, what, are your, what is your vision for my life? You may be at mid-career. You may be 55 years old, and you've been in this job for a while, but there's something that God's nudging you to do, but you're not comfortable with leaving the security. God may be nudging you. Third, one thing I did have going for me was I was a world Christian. I was very committed to thinking globally. Here's the big picture. We serve a global God. Most of us sitting in this building today have heard the gospel time after time after time. When I'm sitting in our little apartment in Vilnius, Lithuania, I have people walking by that apartment every day who have never, ever heard the good news. When I have spoken at the International Church in Vilnius, I can see the palpable hunger on the faces. The students come in to hear my lecture. It's acceptable to come when it's a lecture. So they come for this lecture. One student a while back said after the message, now I understand. For the first time in my life, I understand why Christ why Jesus died on the cross. I, I never understood this before. They haven't heard. Two billion people in the world have never heard of Jesus. Did you, did you hear me say this? Two billion people have never heard of Jesus. They haven't rejected Jesus. They just didn't know about him. Your job your skill may be the link to put you in a place where you could connect with those persons who have not heard. In fact, 
I would encourage you to pray globally. Here's one of the best books you could ever, ever find. You can find it at a local Christian bookstore or buy it online, Operation World. Now, this is a very dangerous book because it, will, it can shake your life. It lists every country in the world. It's, list, it's a prayer guide each day. You're praying for a different nation. But it will shake you. Be careful. Be ready to be moved and maybe to move because it will change your life. As you're watching the news, pray globally. Are you praying for the salvation of Fidel Castro? Are you praying for Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, to come to know Jesus? The nuclear crisis in Iran, are you praying for the salvation of Ahmadinejad? We must pray, engage, not just me and my wife, my son John, his wife, us four, no more. We need to have a global vision as we're praying. Now, the problem with this is it, you have to make changes if you're praying. So that's why number four is focus on obedience, not on a call. If we're finding those God, good works which God prepared in advance for us to do, we have to focus on obedience. Someone asked Mother Teresa, when were you called to serve the poor and the dying in the streets of Calcutta? She thought a moment, drew herself up to her full five foot, one inch height, and said, I wasn't. I was merely following Jesus, and this is where he led me. So I don't want to hear anybody here today say, well, I'm not called to go teach overseas, or I'm not called to fill in the blank. I want to know what does obedience mean for you. Now, this is, this is, this is the difficult part because we found that obedience isn't easy. We had a comfortable home in Kansas City, and we moved to a little apartment of 800 square feet. Our kids were upset. Our hearts were yanked out knowing we're away from our kids. We didn't know what would happen. We didn't know how to do this. My role in the organization was changed. Why did we do all that? Because Lithuania was there with a desperate need, and the Lord, through his own nudging, made it clear. Little did I know that there was a need in that strange little country that nobody's ever heard of. Three million people. I mean, think about it. Three million people. So you could fit five Lithuanias in the greater L.A. area. And you know, we found out that there's a need for mature men. Now, believe it or not, I fit in that category at 61. <laughs> the Soviet years had wiped out the Christian leadership between 55 and up. There are very few Christian leaders at that level. So most of the leaders of ministries and churches are young people that are in love with God and are doing a great job, but they're frankly, floundering. They're looking for direction. And so all of a sudden, I had a new point in my job description from God to be a mentor, a friend, a listener, to walk alongside younger leaders of groups like the Inner Varsity or Campus Crusade or our church a while back. The pastor had been under pressure from the KGB back in the Soviet days, and he was a strong and fearless leader. But the years have been tough, and they've worn down the leaders. And he confessed to Terry and I a few days ago. He said, being with you has reminded, reminded me of who I am, of what I need to be and what I need to do. A unique role. Much of it is just having time to host students in our home. We had a whole group of students just a few nights ago. One group told us a few days ago, they said, we're never more at peace than when we're in your apartment. We pray over the meals before we eat. Strange ways that God comes. What does it mean to be salt and light in a place where you can't speak the language, where you're blind, deaf, and dumb? Going to the grocery store, there's a limit to taking I translate on my phone and trying to find stewed tomatoes on the shelf. It, it doesn't, it's not easy at 61 for sure. My challenge to you, though, is 
That's what obedience means. Is it difficult when we leave our grandkids in a few days now from Kansas City? We'll cry our eyes out. Difficult to leave our moms? Yeah, it's tough. Tough to leave our kids? They're okay with it now, but it's still tough to leave them? Yeah, it's painful. Really gut-wrenching painful. But it's fulfilling to know that we have the joy of being in a place where we bring the fragrance of Jesus in our brokenness and in our limitations. We bring the joy of Jesus into a place that is depressed and has no hope. A student told Terry just a few days in class, ago in class, I have no hope. And we hear that everywhere we go. And so we're there to offer the love of Jesus and the hope of Jesus. A lot of uncertainties. There's no textbook on how to do this. And what God leads you to do will be different. But if you're faithful, he will bring this deep sense of joy and fulfillment. At any stage in life, if you're 21 or 41 or 61 or 81, there's a, a deep fulfillment that I cannot quantify for you in knowing you've surrendered. You're all his. And there's nothing off limits for him that he can't ask you to do. Several years ago, I was in Kiev, Ukraine. And the uh, head of the Communist Party had asked me to meet with them. And I was a little frustrated because I didn't know what I should meet with him for. And the Communist Party is still very strong. I was there just a few weeks ago, a powerful force in Ukraine today. So I made an opening statement. I said, my name is Daryl McCarthy. I'm with the International Institute for Christian Studies, and we send Christian professors to teach their subject from a Christian worldview. I wasn't obnoxious, but I was, I was pushing the buttons there. I said, what is the purpose for our meeting today? <clears throat> the Communist Party chief made his opening statement. He said, well, Dr. McCarthy, we have made a study and we have determined that Christianity is the only force that can remake our society. I've got plenty of time for the meeting. My schedule just cleared out. I'm open. I'm open. It turned out about a two-hour meeting, they wanted Christian leaders from America to come to show them how Jesus makes a difference in the public arena, in politics. As we're coming to the end of the meeting, I'm saying, now let me explain the kind of people we will send to you. I said, I can do that best by telling you a little bit more about my story. And I told about being raised by godly parents in, on a farm in Missouri. My mother and my father served Jesus, and they taught me that Jesus was the Son of God, and the Bible is the Word of God. But in my late teens, I had lots of questions. How can I know that the Bible is true? How can I know Jesus is God? How can I know this is really true? And to my delight, after my search, I found there's mountains of evidence supporting the intellectual and spiritual incredibility of the message of Jesus. But I said, following Jesus is more than a cerebral experience. He changed my life. He brought me peace and purpose and direction. I said, there's one sentence you need to understand to understand who I am and who we will send to you. And a translator spitting out a translation, doing a great job all the way along. Jesus is my very best friend. There was silence. I looked, and the translator laughed. I looked again. I realized that it wasn't a laugh of, of derision. It was this awkward laugh. He couldn't linguistically put his brain around 2,000-year-old person being best friends with someone sitting next to him. He, he couldn't handle it. But finally, he... He put it out, just word for word. <clears throat> Another long silence. One of my colleagues spoke up and said, well, tell us what you think of what Dr. McCarthy just said. One of the lieutenants spoke up and he said, Jesus Christ, historic person, yes, I believe. Jesus Christ, a person living now, I do not know. I will study. I will find out. I 
hope, Christ living now. And when he said those words, I realized I was hearing the heart cry of millions of people around the world that are hoping for a savior, hoping for someone who cares and who can forgive and who can guide. I hope Christ living now. Every job is a holy calling. Your challenge is to ask, am I serving where I'm serving? In the, is, that, is that where God wants me to serve? We are in the midst of an abundance of Christian resources. We have 95% of all the Christian resources in the world right here in America. One Christian worker for every 304 Americans. We're in the Muslim world. We have one Christian worker for every 4,800,000 Muslims. Hindu world, we have one Christian worker for every 5,400,000 Hindus. If you were starting a soup kitchen, would you, would you start a soup kitchen in a city that's full of fat, obese people? Or would you start a soup kitchen in a place that's teeming with starving, emaciated bodies? Spiritually, we have this treasure. My challenge to you is, are you serving where you're supposed to serve? Your job, whatever it is, is a holy calling. You are God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. What are you to serve? Where are you to serve? Get alone with him. Surrender. As one who has recently had to surrender all over again, I can tell you there is joy and fulfillment in serving him.